we are going to move on to a panel of the past recipients of the Edmore Agricultural Prize. And hopefully we'll have you back at Bavara to share more of where you've gone from this moment forward. But let's segue to hear about some of these other startup companies that have received this recognition. They're some of our favorites and they proudly display their checks in their offices. When we when we give tours, we point them out. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jack Mark. I think it's also important to note that Jack Mark is leading our new ag tech accelerator. And one of the participants in the first cohort is Telltale. And they are one of the past more prize winners. So Jack, tell us more about um, startup panel that you have here today and introduce your speakers. Thank you, Laura. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Classic. Uh, I'm sorry, we missed, I think, a C in your name on that slide, but uh, we got oh. you <laughs> <laughs> fixed on your own description here. No, that's fine. Um, what's funny is a lot of times when messaging people whose first name is Mark, I add a C. Um, just a creature of habit, I guess. So uh, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Um, just a, a quick note. Um, she did mention that one of the more uh, innovation prize winners, and we'll get to their introductions in a second, is a, is a member of our uh, inaugural Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator cohort. And the, the, just in 10 seconds, because I want to make sure that our, our panel gets the majority of the time. If you're interested in learning more about some stuff that we have coming up this week as part of Ag Tech Week, there's a QR code here in my background that you can scan. And um, I'll, and if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on uh, on email or uh, or LinkedIn. But Jack, let's talk a little bit about it before we move on to the panel. So Generator is a nationally ranked accelerator program, and we couldn't be more thrilled that they chose Champaign Urbana to be the location for them to launch this Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. It took off with more than 150 applicants that you were curating and interviewing very personally to go through a very deliberate process to get to the eventual five. So we're very happy for them to be sharing the results of their experience in your cohort tomorrow. We hope people will join us for that experience. I'll say Jack brings his own entrepreneurial story too. So he didn't come to this in leadership without having the pain and the hustle of working through a startup company. His startup company was part of, he was part of Agribull's team here that started in the incubator Enterprise Works in the research park. It eventually grew in the research park as a company that had probably around 60 employees and then was acquired. But in that process, he came up with some of their early products, including a rain gauge that would be able to think about the, the rain impact on crops and even helped with a crop insurance partnership with a major industry partner. He also worked at Horizon Hobby in our town, one of the companies that was early in the drone space and um, some of the robotics being applied in agriculture. And he was with Agribull at the time of the acquisition um, when it was uh, it became acquired by Nutri and Ag Solutions. And of course that exit's very important. And I think you're working with startups to try to get to an outcome that will achieve uh, a result that investors are pleased to see. And this was one of our favorite success stories. Jack is an alum of the University of Illinois and an alum of Parkland College. So we're happy to have a Champagne um, product here leading this discussion and our Ag Tech Accelerator. All right, take it away. Thank you, Laura. Um, and yeah, we, I really, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit biased from having lived here for the better part of the last 15 years, but uh, I really do think that uh, there could not be uh, a, a better location to, to, to uh, put a program like this. So we're very excited, um, and, and really the, the experience through this first program has validated that. Um, and, and we've got um, quite a bit of evidence uh, that, that this was a great place to do this. Um, so we'll, we'll jump into the Innovation Prize winners. I wanna give them each an opportunity to introduce themselves, uh, provide one or two about their company and the year that they won the uh, prize. So um, uh, Angela, why don't we start with you? Sure. Hi, my name is Angela Green Miller, and I am co-founder and president of Telltale. Uh, Telltale creates software for pig production systems, and our focus is on delivering actionable decisions uh, in a simple format. We received the Moore Innovation Prize in 2019, uh, and we're also super excited to be finishing the G Beta Accelerator program in the first co cohort. Thank you, uh, Daphne. Would you like to go next? Great. Hi, uh, Daphne Proust here. I'm the CEO of Aspiring Universe. Our company is using satellite signals and other remote sensing to uh, monitor farm production and resources 
used on the farm, and that includes water, nutrients, carbon, and also we're able to uh, assess outputs like crop yield. Uh, we won the Moore Prize in 2020. Thanks. Jinmei, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Chinmay Soman. I'm the co-founder and CEO at EarthSense. Uh, at EarthSense, we do robotics and AI for agriculture uh, throughout the value chain. We've been commercializing mostly in the crop improvement space, working with you know some of the names uh, that we see here uh, throughout the conference today. Um, and then you know the next generation uh, robots and AI at EarthSense are aimed more at farmers to help them transition rapidly and effectively uh, towards the more regenerative agricultural practices. Uh, we won the award in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Thank you. And Kastub. Oh, sorry, uh, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay. Hi, this is Kastub Bhalerao. Uh, I had the honor of being the first recipient for the Moore Award in 2017. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Soil Diagnostics. Um, and up until 2020, I was a uh, professor in ag and biological engineering. Uh, so the Moore Award was a significant contributor to me making a jump finally. So since 2020, I've been running soil diagnostics full time. Uh, we provide software for ag businesses uh, that then in turn serve uh, farmers. So we are working with um, insurance companies, soil testing labs, a number of different agencies providing ERP-like solutions for ag businesses. Thank you. So these these are our panelists, and and uh, this is uh, we'll get the most out of this if uh, folks, as they think of questions, go ahead and drop them into the chat, and I'll keep an eye on that, and uh, we'll get to those. So while people are kind of thinking about uh, questions, I think one of the things that uh, definitely is very of interest to me, and some of you touched on this in your introduction, so maybe if you could expand on this, but um, what impact did the Moore Innovation Prize have on your company, and and especially in those early days, what did those funds allow you to do? Are we going in the same order? <laughs> Whoever, whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> All right, well, I'll jump in. Um, so at the time when we won the Moore Innovation Prize, we were still very concept-based and we were, we've were we done a pretty extensive customer discovery, um, which is ongoing, it never ends. Um, but we were able to hire a user-focused designer to develop an interface that we could then further our customer discovery and uh, lean into product development. And that has catalyzed us towards software development. So. I guess I'll go next. Um, at the time we won the prize, we had only been operating for about two months. Now it's about one year ago. <clears throat> and uh, un until then, the funding for the company had come from uh, founders who are all on the faculty uh, at the university, um, primarily Kayu Guan, who you heard speak earlier. So. Um, We've made a decision based on those funds as well as other incoming uh, sources of funding that we're going to bootstrap the company for a while while it grows. We've, we've been able to get commercial revenue that's meeting our operating cash needs. And I would say the Moore Prize really provided key capital to kickstart this process. Um, it supported the early stage research and then that allowed us to market that research to some of our customers. Okay, so um, uh, we used the $5,000 to uh, build an injection mold for one of our first uh, soil testing cups. That those that injection mold is still operational. Um, those cups are still operational. That that part of the business is still operational. So you know that's that's been really great for us. Um, we're looking forward to finding ways to pay it forward. Yeah. For EarthSense, the uh, the sort of recognition and prestige that came with the award was fantastic. You know, we still have the big check displayed in our office. So anytime anybody comes in, they see, you know, it's one of the awards that EarthSense has won, the first award. Um, and then uh, from more pragmatically, uh, we actually uh, bought almost all of our 3D printers, which printed our first sort of, you know, 2019, uh, 2018 uh, robots um, how many, I think 30 robots or so that we built uh, fully 3D printed. So all of those came off of the Moore Award uh, startup capital. So it was, it was a fantastic shot in the arm 
that allowed us to get off the ground up and running and generate lots of revenues from uh, selling those robots. I think one of the things that from new product launches to new companies is sort of a, a battle you never really stop fighting is figuring out how to get your technology in front of the people that you feel like can use it the most. But especially when you have very little history or no history uh, with customers, landing your first few customers, there are a lot of challenges in uh, kind of figuring figuring that out. And it's, obviously for, for startups, it's especially important to try to get through that, get over the hump, land the first few customers as quickly as possible. So what, what, are, what were some of the challenges that you faced um, in terms of getting that technology into the right hands and, and communicating to the customer the value of the technology, but also getting feedback from them on, on how, they, how they perceive that. I, I can jump in. <laughs> um, we've really gone in two phases. The first phase was that uh, Dr. Guan had an incredible scientific network and some of his uh, network were resident in large companies that were trying to solve similar problems. And so that was a pretty seamless way. It was a, you know, purely a tech sale where, where an expert talks to an expert. Um, but to get to a more recurrent revenue model, what we've done is we've been able to get um, individuals who have been working in the commercial world for many years to come in and uh, partner with us and leverage their networks and start making sales. So I, I think that as you scale and, and move along, you need to transition to commercial expertise and nothing like a person who's been at it 40 years and has a Rolodex that's uh, you know, very deep. So that, that's been a great help to us. So, so Daphne, I, I do kind of want to follow up on that if it's okay. Yeah. The, when, when, when you have your outbound sales force in the early days and then, and then now, do you have any sort of feedback loop to kind of, you know, to go back into, into product development or, or your communications people to kind of say what's working, what's not working and, and, and what, what kind of adjustments do you make based on that? Just kind of curious on how you, how that sales isn't just outbound and, and kind of what. Right. Comes right. It initially um, the, <laughs> the product, if you will, was kind of a data dump, people asking for information and uh, Excel files moving. And um, as, as we learn more from customers, we got a sense of what people really want and from that have designed product. So our, our head of product is constantly on the phone with the people in the sales team, understanding feedback from customers. And from that, you, you, know, you boil it down to some common threads, produce a product that, that can be recurrent. But that, that feedback loop is really critical and the tech team is, is in on all of this. They, they get drug along on business development conversations and uh, they're very happy when things become routine and they don't have to uh, get in the middle of every conversation. So they're eagerly supporting that transition. If, if I may, sure. I'd be kind of curious to get your thoughts because I mean, I have a little bit of insider knowledge, I guess. I know you've just gone through, are going through this process right now in terms of refining your initial go-to-market uh, strategy. So just kind of, Maybe you'd like to share some of the lessons learned uh, around that sort of feedback also of sort of launching product, but also getting feedback on it at the same time. Yeah, well, you've got to find the market pain, right? And, and uh, a, a scientist and technical person sees tremendous opportunity, tremendous applications. But if you're solving a problem that isn't causing pain in the market, that, that's a challenge. And in some cases in this space, there are, um, opportunities that are real and here and now, and others are more futuristic. And so we're really focused on what's real, what's recurrent. And in the meantime, the futuristic things are business development conversations. But the key is, you know, the customer has to feel some pain. And if they don't, you know, it's a nice to have. It, it isn't something they're gonna jump up and buy. It's yeah, that's that's a that's a really good point. That's uh, and it's priced. You know, they expect it to be priced accordingly. Is it? Is it Definitely. You're alleviating a pain point, or is this like you said, kind of a nice to have? Yeah. And I think Angela, for for Telltale, is very much laser focused on a specific pain point, and 
Um, so I mean, maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't mind kind of sharing your experiences over the last, uh, you know, as you've kind of gone through customer discovery. Yeah, sure. I'm going to circle back to that question. First, I want to highlight, because I look at these four companies and the one that, that won the award this year, and I'm uh, uh, marveling at the importance of connections to the university and these mutually beneficial relationships, because I would say the same thing that we started with, you know, the network that I had from my professional side. So also as a, a, a university faculty member, but that very quickly evolved into the need to interface with students and, and alums and, and other companies as well. And there's this beautiful network that we have here. And, and so I just want to kind of point that out that we've seen it all day long, but in the space, just want to hit that again. Uh, and talk about how important it is for the the space that that this summit and the broader community here has created for us to uh, really foster these new technologies. Um, so I think that's really important. Uh, and specific to Telltale, you know, our MVP is is kind of in a conundrum. We're in the conundrum space. We're focused on overcoming challenges of on farm adoption. Uh, and that means that we ourselves have to overcome the challenge of adoption. Uh, and so that's been a uh, where we've spent a lot of our, our focus, a lot of our time on really understanding our users uh, all the way from uh, the barn level, slat level employees and their experience interfacing with our product and, and bringing value there so they want to use it uh, and taking that all the way up the chain to administrative level decision makers and ensuring that they also have value from what we're providing um, so that it it doesn't create more of a pain point than it solves. So I think it's a little bit of echoing what Daphne is saying there, that, that we can create amazing technology that does really cool things in a research setting. And then the translation of that onto the farm um, doesn't bring as much benefit as it could uh, if we thought about things a different way. So that's been part of our, our learning process is really understanding our users and our customers uh, and how to make sure we're bringing benefit as much as possible to everyone in that process so that there isn't anyone in there who feels like, oh, this is more of a burden than a help. So thank you for that, Angela. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's those are really important, really important takeaways. And I think it, there's, as you guys have kind of talked about the value to your customers, uh, there's a very, there's a very uh, there's a heavy question, it's a loaded question. First question we got in um, around integrating your software with existing products, and I, I would if, if, if the uh, person who asked the question will allow me to embellish a little bit, not just with physical products but existing software stacks and platforms and things like that. I know from my experience and from people that I've talked to, it's very it's very rare that you launch a piece of enterprise software that can actually get to function in a vacuum without having to talk to anybody else's software. And so I'm sure all of you have dealt with that and kind of be kind of curious to, to hear how you navigated that um, without allowing those integrations to become a distraction or to take away from your core mission. And uh, Jen May, I, I think, yeah, if you wouldn't mind going first on that, because I, I know you guys have kind of really uh, dug into that, so. Yeah, yeah, I can jump in on that. Uh, so the sort of physical thing that people see when they look at our product is the robot uh, but of course most of the important stuff is in the software stack right the ai machine learning algorithms the cloud infrastructure to analyze all that data and then report that data out to uh, the analyzed uh, results out to our end users um, and looking back at it i guess uh, uh, in terms of like how, uh, what did it look like to integrate uh, software? Uh, we're still doing it, uh, you know, it's kind of an ongoing process, uh, but looking back at it, it's kind of an insane thing that we did that, you know, we did this whole thing, right? Uh, robot hardware, autonomous navigation, uh, AI machine learning algorithms, uh, you know, cloud infrastructure, building all of that out uh, as a tightly integrated product, it's, you know, Try not to do it is my advice. Uh, but once you're on the other side of it, I guess you reap the rewards. Um, and then of course the you know final piece, as you mentioned, Jack, you know, is uh, interoperability with our customers' uh, software stack as well. And we're kind of you know dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis relative to what we've done so far. Uh, it's technically uh, less cumbersome, I would say, although, you know, obviously no less important to, you know, uh, execute properly. Uh, so uh, with, you know, how we've done it uh, carefully and with great effort, I guess. 
and this is one I, I think if there's other people that have experiences with this, I, I think it'd be valuable for them to weigh in on as well. Um, so I, it, Daphne, I know you have cost but I believe you have as well. Yeah, so um, I can just jump in. So um, ag businesses, uh, the things that they want to pay for and the things that you spend your time building are two completely different things. So you got to realize what those things are. Um, and in our case, that was, you know, um, everyone want like, you know, if you're designing a piece of software and you're launching it out there, there's constantly this push and pull between, oh, I want a button right here to do what I needed to do. But then the rest of the clients actually aren't asking for that. So you have this constant pushback against like, okay, you know, you got to balance what, what makes sense from a maintenance point of view and a training point of view and so on with respect to what the client really wants. Um, and, and that conversation is always fun. What I, what I should say is that having spent five years sort of developing and integrating and, you know, exporting to all sorts of different formats and importing from all sorts of different formats, um, the, the, the thing that people really, really appreciate is the simplicity, right? And so, um, it reminds me of this quote I used to have on one of my books, a good design isn't what you have in the the program it's what you can no longer take away so over time the systems have gotten simpler i mean the, the, what we've actually been putting out has gotten simpler and simpler and simpler uh, and that's that takes a, that takes a journey that takes five years to figure out uh, but at that point once again like Chinmay said once you're on the other side every small um, change or every new integration is a jujitsu move it's a very small move that you have to make to account or, or allow for that new functionality so it, it's fun on fun being on this side now. Yeah, I'd say we're early in that process, but we have our eyes on that as well. And we found a number of, of companies, some well-established and some other startup companies that we really want to integrate with, uh, but there's always a risk there. The risk is, you know, what if we're dependent on one another and one of us fails? Uh, so the creativity comes in and finding ways to collaborate uh, without being dependent. Um, and, and I don't have the solutions yet, but, but we're certainly uh, <laughs> have our eyes on it and are, are looking for creative opportunities to do that. There's a lot of really amazing tech that's coming out. Uh, there's a, a huge wave of it and lots of, uh, I, I love the, the reference earlier to if we, it was Dean Kidwell who said, if we would just work together, we could solve these problems so much faster and, and with better solutions. So I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of that. <laughs> Daphne, I see, I see you came off, off mute. Did you want to weigh in on this as well? Well, um, it's not so relevant for us. We're, we're mostly providing data to other parties. So our, our integration is really focused on getting our data onto their platform in ways that work for them. Uh, so, you know, I think a little bit different model. We're keeping uh, the software pretty closely held. So we do have one more. There's another question in the in the Q and A, and I, I really like this one because I think there are two schools of thoughts on this. And um, so, for for all of you, do you feel like innovation is most effectively driven from within the industry, or from disruptive organizations who see the pos possibilities from other industries and look for a path to apply them to ag? Um, I'll, I'll start, and you know. Uh, See, see what others think. My, my personal view is within the industry. Um, I think there's a big learning curve in understanding in, in reality what agriculture deals with day to day. And so if no one in the company has any experience with agriculture, no one grew up on a farm, they've never you know, seen a farm, they're sitting in Manhattan, um, it's a tough thing to do. It's, it's really tough to solve a problem you don't understand. So I think you have to have somebody that understands the industry on the team. So before anybody else jumps in, just by, since you all have your cameras on, by a show of hands, how many of you had a background in ag before starting your startup? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, well let let's add some, let's add some color, some color to that. Who would who would like to jump in next? Yeah, I'll build on what Daphne was saying, and actually, I'll take it backwards one more step. That I think um, I think our agriculture producers and other members of the industry should be involved in defining the problems. 
Um, and I think that's the most important foundation there for, you know, it doesn't matter who solves them. The definition of the problem is the most important thing because, uh, you know, creating a, a technology and then pushing it to another industry, it's not necessarily going to solve a problem. And most times probably not in the right way, much as Daphne was saying, like you have to have the perspective of the, 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 the person you're solving the problem for in order to get the solution right. Uh, but then to pay it forward, I think it's a mixture. I think there's a lot of great solutions in other industries that will translate well uh, if they're if they're put in the right context. Uh, so I don't know that we need to solve all of our own problems, uh, but we certainly should should have our agricultural industry defining those problems. And and it would be great if we could cooperate in a way that we're defining them uh, in a in a way that. Uh, can be communicated to other industries so that they can say, oh, wait, I do have a solution that, that will work for you guys. And we don't really always do a good job of that. We speak our own language, they speak their own language. And it's like, oh, we, we actually don't overlap when it's not the case at all. So, and I'm sure that Chinmay and Kostum have things to add to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what I've learned is that our the solutions, yes, we spend most of our time developing technology but the solutions that are most meaningful out there have to do with the fact that the farmer is 60 years old and doesn't have too many people behind them coming up and continuing or wanting to continue on the farm. Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that is the biggest problem, at least in the row crop space in most of the developed world. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question for us as technologists, like how are we going to contribute to that specific problem? Uh, and I don't know. <laughs> still trying to find that one out. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of interpret this question slightly differently about sort of, uh, you know, within the industry as in within existing large organizations in the industry versus, you know, we are, our sense is part of the ag industry itself, right? Uh, so it really comes down to priorities and resources for the large companies, which are you know, under tremendous pressure to perform for their shareholders, you know, keep the existing business going, all of that kind of stuff, uh, really looking out at innovative ways of not really disrupting, but like take, taking their business to the next level is not really something they can uh, allocate enough resources to, at least that's what we've seen. You know, we work with most of these large uh, ag, uh, seed and chemical industry players for the last three or four years. Um, they would love to, but they don't have the internal, uh, like that's not high enough on the internal priority list. Um, on the flip side for EarthSense, like creating this, you know, uh, high resolution field phenotypic product is our only priority and we're running at it with all possible speed, right? Um, so for, from our perspective, that becomes a way of delivering that innovation to the larger industry uh, much faster and much more effectively than the industry insiders uh, can create. And we've seen you know, several uh, internal projects sort of come and go uh, even since before we started uh, who tried to do this and then kind of you know, uh, you know, didn't really work out because the, there is a certain pace of this kind of product, complex product creation. Um, and then finally to Angela's previous point about you know, being part of the university ecosystem uh, I, I'll, I'll pay $10 to Julian later. Uh, but uh, being part of the un university system allows us uh, access to this amazing, like deep and diverse pool of talent uh, and perspectives that we can create uh, solutions that probably would be much more difficult to envision and execute uh, inside one of these organizations. Um, so I think, you know, new solutions often uh, would come uh, from uh, outside of these large uh, organizations, but still, as Daphne said, like, yeah, deep industry knowledge is extremely important uh, to make sure that you understand the problem correctly and are solving the right problems. So we're essentially at time now, and I want to be respectful of, of the agenda and schedule. So I, I did want to get sneak one more question in for each of you, just uh, your, your quotable quote or motivational poster snippet, one piece of advice that you would offer entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting their own company. And uh, uh, Kostu, why don't you go first? Don't assume you know the problem. Great. I hope he didn't take anybody else's. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> 
Uh, Chin Meng? Yeah, I'll just rephrase that basically, listen to your customers. Angela? Well, I, I was my number one, but I don't wanna be a broken record. So I will, I will add to that and say, find your passion and weave that in with what you do as you're solving someone else's problems. <laughs> right. Daphne? Figure out the pro product strategy before you launch. Like, it's really key. That's, that is a recipe for success for sure. Uh, so thank you to all of our panelists and uh, I hope the rest of you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks. Thank you to our startup companies for being success stories that we get to celebrate and talk about. Another